everybody. Good. There we go. Good morning, everybody. It is so good to be together. If you're still in the foyer, please make your way through. We are going to worship together in a moment. Man, it is so good to be together. Amen. Yes. Thank you. There's one amen. Yes. <laughs> the gathering of the believers to worship one King, one God, one Savior, King Jesus. Just before we start singing and worshiping our King, Psalm 96 from verse 4 says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. Friends, great is the Lord. He alone is most worthy of all praise. Can we stand together as we go into a time of worshiping our King? Thanks, Dwayne. I cannot be content There's a shout that breaks through every chain God, we won't be silent And there's a faith that rises through the flames There's a joy that chases the dark away God, we won't be silent Yeah the greater the storm, the louder the song, and the greater the storm, the louder our song. We lift our voices, lift our voices, we we'll make your praise so glorious, glorious. We lift our voices, lift our voices, we we'll make your praise so glorious. There's a song, there's a song that cannot be contained. There's a shout that breaks through every chain. God, we won't be silent. No, we won't. And there's a faith that rises through the flames. And there's a joy that chases the dark away. God, we won't be silent. Jesus, your glorious, glorious, 
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus of that first song, I was just brought to that part in Romans 5 where it says, the first Adam 
became a living soul. But the last Adam initiated a whole new species of humanity that would live from a totally different life source. It says he became a life-giving spirit. And then I had a picture of people with watering cans watering these wilting flowers. And I just felt the Lord say, will you be a water carrier? Will you carry the living water into a wilting world? And just to, to realize Jesus is bringing many sons to glory, that we call to carry his life into a very dark world, but just to live with the joy of heaven in our hearts and the life of God flowing through us. Can there be a higher calling than to carry the life of Jesus to people who don't know him? I just feel such a deep, deep concern that we have the great shepherd who is weeping over this city, who is weeping over this part of our world where he's planted us. And he says, will you be my water carriers? Will you carry the life-giving spirit that I've put inside of you? Will you lift the wilting heads? Will you, will you bring people to birth? Will you bring them into my kingdom? I'm calling you to be water carriers, to carry the life of God wherever you go. Friends, we've all heard the scripture, Matthew 28. Therefore, go. So often we think it's up to us in our own strength. But the power is where Jesus says, go in my authority. It's not up to us, but it's this life-giving spirit. It is Jesus. When we look to him, when we receive from him, he flows through us. Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And he commands us to go with him, in him, and for him. Are we willing to say yes to that, friends? Jesus, who's given us life, has given us all these things, but he wants us to point others to him. Friends, I'm gonna ask the team to sing Shout Jesus from the Mountain again. And right where you are, if you can just open up your heart and ask the Lord, Lord, where is it that you're wanting to use me? It's not what am I doing for you, but Lord, what are you doing? How can we be part of what you're doing? Let's sing that again. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness of the river. Oh! 
Show me a picture of someone sitting by the corner and tied up in ropes, and they have lost hope. They're feeling, how am I going to come out of this situation? But I feel the Lord is encouraging you to mo this morning, saying, look up to me. Look up to me. Don't look down on that situation you are in. Look up to me. And take heart, for I have overcome the world. Amen. Friends, off the back of that word, we're going to break bread together. And the significance of this moment is that Jesus is asking us, when we do this, it's to look to Him, to remind us of the finished work of the cross. Not to remind us that Jesus has died, but, yes, that He died, but that He has risen again. And that we are living in this new covenant through Jesus Christ. And it says in Luke 22, from verse 19, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, so then he took bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance and do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Friends, we're no longer living in an old covenant where we are bound by these laws and rules, but through Jesus, the fulfillment of that, we, through his blood, poured out once and for all, we are living in that new covenant. He's asking us to look to Him, to surrender afresh this morning, to drink of Him, to say yes to Him. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, I thank You that You're a God who sees, that You are a God who knows and that you long for us to reach out, to receive you. Lord, you are a God who opens so many doors and closes so many doors. But what's so incredible is, Lord, you stand at the door of our hearts and you knock. And you want us to open up to you. Lord, this morning as we break bread together, we look to you, Jesus. We look to the finished work of the cross through the blood that was spilled for our ransom. And we say, thank you, Jesus. We say, thank you, Lord. More and all of you, Jesus. Those of us who are struggling, Lord, I pray that you'd help us lift our heads to see you, Jesus. Lift up our heads, Father. You are victorious, God. You are victorious. In Jesus' name. Friends, I'm going to invite you to the tables there. Tables spread around the auditorium. Please come, let's break bread together. i 
vast as the ocean, loving God, danced as the flood, when the prince of life our ransom shed for Fountains of and deep and wide through the flood gates of God's mercy float of lives and gracious side grace and love like mighty rivers. For instance, from above, deep in his peace and perfect justice, kiss the guilty world in Friends, friends, we're just going to sing that song one more time, so I'm going to invite you to please stand as we sing this last song together. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving God, as the flood, when the prayer Life, our ransom shed for us is precious blood. Who is love will not remember. Who can see to sing his praise? He can dance. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains of and deep and wide, through the blood gates of God's mercy flow. 
coat of arms and gracious eyes, grace and love like mighty rivers poured in sin from above, heaven's peace and perfect. Jesus, we glorify your holy name. We lift you up, King Jesus. We are so in awe of you this morning. The finished work of the cross where Jesus, once and for all, you came, you died, and resurrected for us, Lord. Jesus, we love you. We love your presence. May we never cease to sing your praise, God. May we never cease to stand in awe of you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, team. There is nothing like his presence. There's nothing like our King Jesus. There's no one above him, no one beside him. Nothing like King Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Three of us who are in agreement. <laughs> A very, very warm welcome to everyone here joining us. It is so good to be together. If this is your first time joining us, it is so good to have you. I uh, pray that you feel right at home. We have a visitor's lounge where we'd love to meet and connect with you after the meeting, so please don't run off. Stay for a cup of coffee. We'd love to meet with you. We have a visitor's lounge through the curtains, so please do. We'd love to meet with you. Just a few announcements. Nathan Popovich is taking a team through to Semong Kong this coming weekend. So if we could please pray for them as they're going... With Keir Taylor, they're going to evangelize. They're going to help build up and paint some of the schools, one of the schools there, and just be involved with that. So if we could pray for them during this week. I wonder if we could just take a quick moment just to pray for them in the build up coming. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the work that you are doing in Lesotho, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are building your church, Jesus. Lord, I pray for the team heading to Simon Kong this weekend, Lord. I pray for your anointing over them, Father. Thank you, Lord, that as they go in your name, that incredible things will happen, Father. That we're trusting for breakthrough in that place. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to be having a looking in tea on Sunday the 5th of May after both the morning and the evening services. So if you are looking to make HCF your home, please come along to that. To come along to the Looking and Tea, then there will be a supper, but we'll chat more about the supper at the tea. There is a clipboard in the foyer if you want to put your name down. Then 
in May on the 11th and 12th, there is a restoration weekend, which I'm going to ask Trish to come and announce. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we are really privileged to have Mads Daisil coming in two weeks' time. She's going to be here on the 11th and 12th of May. Um, Mads has established a number of resources and courses that we've used here um, to establish Hope Counseling. Um, so it's going to be really special to have her here. She's got such a heart for the church as a healing space. Um, so that is what she's going to be ministering on on the Sunday. And then on the Saturday, we've got a, uh, an input with her with the Hope Counseling team. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in the Hope Counseling team, you are so welcome to come and find me afterwards, and I can give you more information about that morning. That is specifically for the counseling team. But in the afternoon, we're having a session called Weights, Worries, and Wearies. Uh, weariness, I keep getting the order wrong. Um, and so we're having a session in the afternoon, um, and that is one that we're really encouraging you to spread widely to friends and family. Um, I was reading the other day a statistic that subjectively, um, South Africans are the fourth, have the fourth worst self-reported mental health in the world. Um, so I think as a nation, people People are struggling. And so if you've got people who you feel would benefit from a biblical perspective around weights, worries, and weariness, um, please invite them to that. We would love to have them. We're going to be meeting at Crossways Church. Um, and then please join us on the Sunday um, to sort of just get some input really around the church, the healing space. We've seen this beautiful ministry emerging here at HCF. Um, and so, yeah, we would love to, love to have as many of you here as possible on that Sunday. Thank you so much, Trishy. Brent's got a quick announcement for us. So. Brent up. Who believes that the Lord is moving in South Africa in this time and in this season? Eh? Amen. Eh? Just God is building His church. He's getting hold of people's lives and He's moving people on. And in the same way, He's doing this in Zimbabwe. We think we've got it bad, but in Zimbabwe, it is hectic to another level or another depth, actually. And so um, we are going back to Vic Falls to the geographic training time in July. We're so looking forward to it. We had the blessing and opportunity to go last year with Dwayne and Lowell's and the team that was ministering from the, the Zim MCMR team into Vic Falls. Going back there in July, um, in the week of the first, the first week of July. And so this is just a, a call out there for those who are feeling called. You feel that God is speaking to you to maybe come in and join in with us. We're going to go and serve the local churches there, serve the, the team in Zimbabwe, and just be available for how God wants to use us. So the invitation's open. Please come and chat to me. And we are just so excited to see what God wants to do in us and through us, but also bring back with us, because we know that we will learn and grow in the process. This isn't only about giving. So I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Thanks, Brent. Dwayne's got another announcement for us. Hello, everybody. Trust you're doing well. Um, we had um, an amazing week up in Joburg this week at National Elders, and we really just love the partnerships that we're involved in. Uh, to, for us, that's the New Covenant Ministries International a team that we partner with, and my goodness, I don't know where we'd be without uh, those strong relationships, you know, and, and you know, looking at the book of Acts, you really believe, I'm not sure there's another way actually to do church, as we see in Scripture, than partnering uh, with local um, eldership teams, partnering with translocal teams as Paul and Timothy and all those guys, and, and certainly uh, putting that into practice, we gain so much benefit out of it. Um, so we absolutely loved us. There was a whole bunch of us who went uh, went up, not even just the elders, some business people too, um, just stirring about partnering uh, more in the kingdom. And, and really the goal is just to take this gospel everywhere. We believe Jesus is coming soon, right? And, uh, you know, it's not the Antichrist that sets the clock on when he comes. It's not anybody else. It's not the mark of the beast. It's not uh, the earthquake. Those signs will happen as we're getting closer. And there seem to be more and more of them. So I think we're getting closer. But he says this gospel will be preached to every people group, and then the end will come. And so we, we certainly want to play our role, and that's what this is about. Um, so I, I'm very excited. Um, we, um, Bryden and Kelly and Tyler, uh, separately, not e even as a family, even though they are a family, but Tyler, for what he is, um, they were invited by some of the team guys to go on training with Tyron Daniel this last week. And uh, on Friday, they were uh, prayed on to the NCMI team. So we're just very stoked for that as a church. Yeah, I think it's amazing. 
Um, yeah, so we, we really just celebrate. Um, we just, you know, Brent's on his way, Nate's taking a team. You know, there's something wrong with a person when they just focused on themselves. And I think the same for a local church. And I'm so grateful to partner with all of you that we have a heart, not just for ourselves, but to see churches planted out there and see dis, uh, nations discipled. So I think that's wonderful. And uh, just, yeah, finally also, just to remind us that on Tuesday at 10 o'clock here, we're going to celebrate Colin Holmes's life and uh, give him a good send-off. Um, and please just keep Barbara in your prayers. Um, what a legend he was. Yeah, thanks, Ty. Thanks so much, Dueno. I'm going to invite Stu Pull up, who's going to be sharing the word. Before this, Stu comes, oh, he's getting his way up. The kids, are you guys ready? <laughs> On your marks, set, careful down the stairs, and go. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here together as a church. And uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks for this opportunity. Very excited to be working through Romans 11 this morning. If you've ever read Romans 11, you know the feeling that I have as I approach it. Um, and if you haven't, get ready for a wild ride. It's going to be fun. Um, but it's, it's an amazing chapter. And God's doing some amazing stuff this morning. Um, Dolly's word is exactly what I've been feeling over this week that even through this chapter, which is about some kind of big stuff about national Israel and what's going to happen in the future and those kind of things, God wants to do something with each of us this morning, and that maybe there will be, and I think there are some people here who are sitting in the corner struggling in a difficult situation, and God wants to speak to you through His Word this morning. So really excited for that. You can turn across to Romans chapter 11. I'm going to have some of the main parts of the scripture up on the screen, um, not all of it. It's difficult to, for us with time to read through all of it, but I'm going to, what I really want to do is by the time, <clears throat> excuse me, by the time you get home tonight or this afternoon is for you to, yeah, it's not going to be that long. <laughs> Speaking of which, I'm going to set my, <laughs> okay, 25 minutes, we're good to go, Okay. Um, but when you, when you get home, it's for you to be able to go back to the Scriptures, and hopefully by us talking about it this morning, you're able to then work through it yourself and see what God has to say. So um, we're going to read through, the, read through some of chapter 11. I do want to say before I start that uh, Duane fulfilled one of my lifelong dreams this morning. I've always wanted to be in worship and do a guitar change halfway through. Like, that is so rock star. Like, somebody had to, like, bring him up, and he, like, he didn't smash the guitar, but it was, anyway, it was very cool. Um, <laughs> okay, we're going to read uh, Romans chapter 11, <clears throat> but it's important to realize the train of history that has led up to this point in Romans 11. So last week, we looked at Romans 10. And actually, this is a chunk of Scripture from Romans 9 to chapter 11 that speaks about Israel. So what's happened, Paul is in a very difficult place. And Paul, has he's a Jew. He was a Jew of Jews. He's a Benjamite, which is one of the tribes that always stayed faithful. And he's been faithful to the law, and he's been called out to, become, to follow Jesus. He's seen that actually all of this was pointing towards the Messiah. And now he's in this place where he's thinking, but what about my people? What about Israel? He knows that... I mean, again, I'm not going to do a, I tried to summarize the Bible in five minutes on last Sunday, but uh, we'll have to do a minute because this is a summary of last week, which is before now. But, um, but he knows that what has happened in the story of God is that God has created man to be an image, to be an image bearer, to show God's glory to the world. And he knows that man fell, Adam fell, and then God had a plan to bring out a nation. So whereas Adam was the first representative in humanity, God said, I'm going to raise up through Abraham a nation that is going to show my glory to the world. And so God comes to Abraham in grace, 
gives him this promise and then raises up through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. He raises up the nation of Israel. And Israel is meant to be this, this idol in a good way, this image, this icon of God, this representation of God's glory to the other nations around them. And God gives them the law and says, this law is for you to set you apart so that people can see what God looks like, so they can see what I look like in action. But we know that Israel didn't manage to do that. And they worshiped other idols, they worshiped other gods, they didn't follow the law. And as a result, they get kicked out of the land. And God always knew this was going to happen. The gospel was, was not, this is not a new thing. God knew they weren't going to manage to do it. This was always part of his plan. But he has to kick them out. They get exiled. So there's this kind of creation, fall, Abraham, Israel, and then exile. They get kicked out of the, out of the promised land because of what they've done. And so this seems like the end for Israel. But the prophets come and they start to bring these promises that there's a remnant. There's this idea of a remnant. We're going to see that today, that, that God is keeping some people in Israel to bring them back one day. It's this amazing view of God's plan. And so they see that, and this is the space that Paul was in when Jesus came onto the scene. And, and what we see is that Jesus comes and he's the ultimate end to the law. That's what we looked at last week. The law was never meant to be the thing that Israel used to separate themselves. It was meant to point them towards the fact that they needed a Messiah. They needed somebody to come as their representative, and that's what Jesus did. And so Jesus comes, and he comes as their representative, and Paul is speaking into this now, but, but what he's seen and what he did as well is that the Israelites have rejected their Messiah. They've missed the point completely. The Gentiles are coming in droves to come and meet Jesus, and they, they're learning about Jesus. But the promised people, God's chosen people, are rejecting Jesus. And so Paul reaches this point of complete despair. He's sitting there in a corner crying. It says in Romans 9, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for my people. He can't get over the fact that these are his people. This is God's chosen people. And they're not coming to Jesus. They're not seeing the Messiah. And so he's broken. This is the kind of anguish that like, wakes you up in the middle of the night. And you think you're asleep and then you're awake and boom, you're thinking about that thing again. It kept him going. He had unceasing anguish. He was so worried about the Israelites and he couldn't understand this is God's plan. He's always said he's got a plan for his people. There's still prophecies to be fulfilled. I know that there's prophecies about Israel that haven't been fulfilled yet. How does this all fit together for my people, the Israelites? And so he's in that space when he comes to chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. And in chapter 9, he starts to go back to the, to the past of, of Israel. And in chapter 10, he discusses the present moment of Israel and why they're missing the point. And that's what we looked at last week. And now we get to chapter 11, and we have the privilege of seeing the end of his thoughts and the end of his wrestling with God and what he gets to. And I'm going to give you the end of the story because it's awesome. But he gets to it and says, from him and through him and to him are all things. God's got a plan to God be the glory. So he changes from unceasing anguish and sorrow. Like complete, he doesn't understand. How can God do this? This doesn't fit in with my understanding of you, God. This doesn't fit in with my understanding of what you're doing with Israel. I can't figure this out to, from him. This, this whole thing is from him. It's through him. Jesus is with me in this, and it's to him. To him be the glory. And he ends up in praise. It's this amazing transition. And what I'm hoping we can do this morning is learn a little bit from Paul. Because I want to ask you, and I've been asking myself, what do I do when I have that unceasing anguish? I wonder if you've been and maybe are in a situation where you have that. I had a particularly tragic time at the end of last year. And I, what Paul describes here, I had that unceasing anguish, waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to fall asleep, endless sorrow, not understanding what God's doing. And, we, and, and in that time, I look back and I think, how did I approach it? And then I look at Paul and I think, how did he approach it? And how did he get to that point? You know, for me, it was spending way too much time looking at stupid videos on Instagram. It's like, just to switch off, but like, like hours of stupid reels of people trying to be funny, you know? And, 
and not wanting to process it and think about it. So having a glass of wine so that I can sleep at night, you know, and, and doing all these things, but looking to all these various things, not looking to Jesus. And what I'm hoping we can do today is two things. We're going to look at, at this on two levels. The one is we're going to look at what Paul has to say about the future of Israel, because it is important. It is really important. We are part of this plan. We form a part and we slot in over here where God has sent the Holy Spirit. He's written the law in our hearts. We get to be the representatives. But the Israelites have not been forgotten. And we would be in trouble if we made the mistake that the Roman church was making, which was to say the, Roman, the Israelites are done. Now it's, the, it's like about what God's doing here. And God has not forgotten Israel. And you're going to see it as we read it. And so we are part of a bigger plan. And, and God is doing something bigger on a global level. And so when God calls you as an individual to be his image again, to, to show your glory, sorry, to show his glory, not your glory, to show his glory to the world through you, he's bringing you into that plan. And so we need to have an understanding to a degree, we'll never have a full understanding, but an understanding of what God's doing at a global level and where we're heading. And... Um, <clears throat> So that's the first part. But the second part, which I think is equally important, is to say, how did Paul go from unceasing sorrow and anguish and end up with from him, through him, and to him be the glory? And then if you're in that situation, can you apply some of those things? And if you're in future situations, which unfortunately Jesus promises us are going to come, you might have a bit of a structure to be able to approach it. So let's have a look at it. Um, the first thing before, before we get into Romans chapter 11, I think one of the keys that Paul can help us with is that he wrestles with God. This is so, so important. Um, because, because what he did was he had this huge kind of problem and he was really struggling. He didn't understand it with God, but he didn't just complain about it. He took it to God. And, and we see the same example in Job. We see the same example in David. But what Job did, if you think about the end of Job, Job and his friends both said some, some really, they were asking some really massive questions about God, right? And at the end, God accepts Job, but not his friends. And God says to Job, you've got to go pray for your friends. Why is it that God accepted Job's complaints about him, but not his friends? And the only difference that you can see really is that his friends spoke about God, but Job spoke to God. And so one of the first things, and this is exactly what Paul does here, is he, he has a problem and he's struggling and he can't see it, but he brings it to God. Jacob himself wrestled with God and then was given the name Israel. That's the whole beginning of Israel, is Jacob wrestling with God. We are called to wrestle with God. And so what we have, as we look through this this morning, is front row seats to the boxing ring, of Paul and God wrestling this out, not in a disrespectful way to God, but the Bible tells us we can wrestle with him and we can ask him questions and we can engage with him and you're gonna see the beauty of what happens when Paul wrestles with God. And so we get to be front row seats and, and there's gonna be five things that we're gonna see that Paul does and I'm gonna tell you them now and then we'll kind of go through it. But number one is he remembers his story. Number two is he turns to scripture Number 2.1 is he turns to Scripture again. Number 2.2 is he turns to Scripture again, and he keeps going to Scripture. He turns to Scripture. Number three, I should know this, hey? Is he's humble, he has humility, and he realizes the importance of that as he engages with God. Number four is he receives revelation from the Holy Spirit. And number five, he's okay with mystery. We're never gonna get all the answers. Job never got all the answers. Job got no answers. He just got God being very sarcastic with him. Job, were you there when I, when I put the stars out? Were you there? Were you there when I stretched out the head? Was, was that you? Were you there? And Job's like, oh, you're right, God. No answers for his problem, but a revelation of God's greatness and a bigger peace that comes when we realize, actually, we're not going to have all the answers. So, number one, remember your story. So Paul's asking the questions, what is the future of Israel? And as he does, he immediately remembers his own story. So 11 chapter one, uh, 11 verse one. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. 
Paul knows that the first example of God not rejecting Israel is the fact that he's standing here right now busy writing this letter. Because God came when Paul was a zealous Israelite going to kill Christians because he didn't think that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus came and said, why are you persecuting me? And gave him a call and showed him who his true Messiah was. God has not forgotten his people. For Paul, it's that simple that first he knows, I'm a Jew, God has come for me. So, so it's this amazing thing. And, and one of the things that we can do when we're in those situations is just look back and remember, how many times has God come through for you? How many times has he been there for you? Think about when he saved you. You might think, I can't believe I did that. Like, is God gonna, has he rejected me? And then you look back and realize, man, I was sinful when he saved me. He's not gonna reject me now. He knew what was gonna happen. You might not know God. You might not know Jesus in that way. And I wanna tell you that right now, he's actually busy working things in you and for you, to him. He's pulling you towards himself. And you feel that tug, and, and sometimes it takes time for God to do his thing. But he's pulling us, and you'll be able to look back and say, from him and through him and to him, he was doing everything. God is calling you right now to come back to your original calling, which is to be an image of God, to be under his kingship and following him. And he's calling you to do that. It's a phenomenal thing to be a part of. And so Paul looks back at the time then and he realizes there's no way that God's given up on the Israelites because I'm an Israelite and he came to me. The next thing he does is he turns to scripture. He turns to the word, word of God. Now, I need to be careful how I say this, but we need to learn something from Paul here because he doesn't jump to Jeremiah 29, 11 and all of his favorite coffee cup verses. He doesn't jump to Psalm 23 or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, which is actually about starving if you read it carefully. But um, he doesn't jump to the like cushy, comforting verses. Those are good. So, I mean, uh, we need all of Scripture, but the point is we need all of Scripture. So he doesn't go to those things just to give himself a calm sense of things. He goes to the worst place that Israel was ever in. This doesn't seem like the right thing for Paul to do. But he goes to the time when, when Israel had com committed complete apostasy. They'd been worshiping other gods. Elijah feels like he's the only prophet left. And he goes and reads that. And from that, he finds wisdom. When I was struggling last year, it was in the last term last year, we went for a weekend away. And my plan was to go and get it all sorted, just think it through and have it fixed, which never works. Um, but... On the way down, so at um, cell group the night before, we read through something from Ecclesiastes. And on the way down, I felt God say, carry on reading through Ecclesiastes. It's not the kind of advice I would give somebody who's struggling with something, because Ecclesiastes is depressing. But um, there was a specific verse that completely changed everything for me in reading through Ecclesiastes. There was a moment, I read it, and suddenly everything changed, this understanding. And so sometimes we need to turn to all of Scripture, and we need all of it, not just kind of our favorite things. So Paul turns to the worst part of Israel's history, and he carries on. He says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? He says, Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left. Maybe Paul's feeling similarly. He can realize that God's called him, but he's, he feels like he's the only Israelite. I'm the only one left. And they seek my life. But this is beautiful. What does God's reply to him? Elijah, I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not on your own. I've got this. I've got 7,000 other guys like you who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And Paul realizes, hey, it's the same here. At this, at, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. It's no longer on the basis of the law. It's no longer on the basis of the nationality of an Israelite. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So what then? Israel to, failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. We're going to talk about that just now. As it is written, and then he quotes from two areas of Scripture that he's obviously been digging into. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. This is a Scripture that speaks about Israel and about how God sees that they are worshiping other gods. And in their hardness, he allows them to be hardened. He hardens them more. And he gives them this blind. He says, go for it. I mean, we, we see that, that 
the end result of sin is that God hands us over to what we want. That's actually the, the judgment that God gives. Is he says, go for it. Be hard. Don't look. Don't see what I'm trying to show you. And that's what he's done. And then David, he goes to the Psalms. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So Paul feels like Elijah. Is he the only one who has missed, that hasn't missed the boat? Elijah's like, I'm the only one, God. And God says, no, no, no. There's much more going on here than you realize. I've got 7,000 people that I've kept as a remnant. Paul realizes if God did that then, he will do it again. And he has always kept a remnant of his people. Even Israel, his chosen people, he has kept a rem remnant. He is faithful to his promises. Israel has been hardened in their hardness, and their table has become a snare. This is this idea of them sitting, relaxing at a table, eating. And that's what the Israelites were doing. We're the chosen people. We've got the law. This is awesome. And it became a snare for them because they missed the fact that the law was pointing towards Jesus. And so he says, it's become a snare. And they've missed the point, but God will still keep a remnant. And Paul, as an individual, and the story of Elijah and multiple other times in Israel's history are proof that he's going to do it. Paul, the next thing that Paul does is he carries on searching Scripture. So he's searched and he's seen there's a remnant. He could stop there, but he's still asking. He's still wrestling with God. He's saying, yeah, there's a remnant, but why are we in this situation? Why are we not here with the Jews being accepting Jesus as their Messiah, getting the promised land back. Why is this not happening? Because that's how I always thought it was going to happen. That's how Paul was expecting that a Messiah would come, a military Messiah, was one of the things that Israel was expecting, to come and give them the promised land back. Why? Why has this not happened? And to, to get to that, we need to remember the whole point of what God was doing all along through Israel is that it was meant to go to the whole world. It was meant to be. It was never meant to be just Israel. It was meant to be going to the whole world. And so Paul says, he finds this amazing truth. And this, this is a bit mind-blowing. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, he begins to see the point of Israel stumbling and missing the point. Through their trespass, through their mistake in missing the Messiah, salvation has come to the Gentiles. The reason that we're sitting here as HCF today is because the Israelites messed up. <laughs> And missed it. And God used that to let the Gentiles come in. Unless you are Jewish. But if you're not Jewish by nationality, we stand here as Gentiles. And part of the privilege we have of being here is because Israel missed the point. But he carries on. Salvation's come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. I'm going to get to that just now. But God's got a whole three-step plan here. If their trespass means riches for the world, in other words, if we experience these riches now because of their sin, how much more will their full inclusion mean? How much better is it going to be when Israel realizes this is the Messiah? Imagine that day when we're here worshiping together with a whole bunch of Israelites who realize we've missed what Isaiah was pointing to and what Jeremiah was and what the whole Torah was pointing to. And they come and worship and we all get to worship together under grace, saved by Jesus. And that's what Paul's looking for. So he sees that God is using Israel's turning away to make the gospel go out to the Gentiles. Now, this is, this is blowing my mind this week. Israel's whole point, the whole vocation and calling that they had continues even when they're being sinful. God still has his way. So think it through. The plan was Israel, in obedience to the law, shows the world God's glory, right? That's the whole point is to show the world God's glory. It comes up over and over again. But they don't, and they're disobedient, and so God, in their disobedience, still uses them as the tool by which the world receives God's glory. The, his plan is never thwarted. Is that the right word? Didn't have that written down there, but that's a cool word to use. His plan is never thwarted. Whatever he's planned will happen. So even when Israel gets it wrong, they could have, we could have come to salvation through Israel showing God to the world. But even when they chose not to do that and to worship other gods and to be disobedient, God uses their disobedience in order that the Gentiles will know Jesus. And that's what Paul is seeing now. He says, because the, the Jews have rejected the Messiah, I'm seeing the Gentiles come in. Paul had a, a ministry to the Gentiles. And so he sees that. It's, um, 
Israel was always called to display God's glory, and it's not new. This is probably why Jesus said to the Canaanite woman, I don't know if you remember that, and I've always struggled with it. She comes to him, she's a Gentile, and Jesus says to her, I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. It's like, it doesn't seem like Jesus. But when you realize that what Jesus was coming to do was to try and help Israel to restore their vocation, that was the first place he went. And we see that over again in the New Testament, is that Paul, Jesus went to the Israel, Israelites first. And then when they rejected him and they weren't going to take up that vocation, the gospel went out to the Gentiles because of that. It's this phenomenal thing that we see, God's plan continuing. Even in their sin, Israel was still fulfilling God's purposes. And then there's this next step, which is, again, mind-blowing. Not only that, but Paul says the Gentiles are being saved for a reason. It's not the only reason, but one of the reasons that we are being saved is in order to make the Jews jealous. There's a three-part plan. Paul says Israel has been hardened for a time. So that, part two, the Gentiles will come to faith. So that, the Jews will eventually look at us as a church and go, we've missed something. This is amazing. This is what the Messiah came to do. And they will come back. And Paul says that he uses his Gentile ministry he magnifies it in the hope that the Jews will become jealous. So Paul says, every time I'm busy kind of talking about my, my ministry to the Gentiles with the Jews, I'm telling them all about what God's doing with you guys because I really want them to get jealous and to come back. And there's this amazing thing, if you don't mind turning to Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of Acts, when Paul is actually in Rome. This is right at the end of Acts, but not the end of God's story. But Paul is in Rome, he's in prison, he calls the Jewish leaders to himself, and he's busy telling them the gospel. He's trying again to convince them, guys, this is your Messiah, you've missed it. And even here, right at the end, he's still doing what he's talking about in Romans 11. Acts 28, verse 28, he says to them, Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He's saying, guys, the Gentiles are listening. And he's trying to make them jealous. He's trying to make them see what God's doing so that they will come back again. It's this amazing thing that, that Paul sees. He goes on in verse, sorry, I flicked out now. In verse 11, uh, verse 13, he, he now turns to talk to the Gentiles. And one of the lessons, I mean, this whole passage on his own, I'm not going to do it justice this morning. But what he does here is he shows the Gentiles that because of all of this, they need to be humble. They mustn't get proud. They mustn't think we the chosen people now. And, and we see it as well as Paul wrestles with this, is that he's humble in his Jewishness, in his national Israelite-ness. There's humility that has to come when you're wrestling with God about these things. And so he turns to the Gentiles to talk to them, and in verse 13 to 24, he speaks to them, and the key message is don't be proud. He says, don't stand as the Roman church thinking that you are now the chosen people and that Israel is out of the picture. That's the same mistake the Israelites made at their table of chosenness, and it became a snare. He links the Gentiles' faith to the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of Israel. He says, the only reason we're sitting here this morning is because of their faith. We've been grafted into the tree. Jesus, uh, God can just as easily graft Israel back into the tree, and he's going to. And then I want to just skip across to verse 25, because Paul then gets a direct revelation from God. So as he's grappling, God speaks to him, and now Paul prophesies what's going to happen. We're not going to get a direct revelation to the degree that it becomes Scripture. So I need to be careful with that. But we do get the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And there are times when the Holy Spirit gives us such discernment over what's going on in a situation that it can bring you such peace. And that's what Paul gets here, but he gets it on a global level of what's going to happen. He says, lest you be wise in your own sights, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, if you read that in the Greek, it's a hardening for a time. So there's a, there's a, there's a time for which Israel is going to be hardened. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Tricky verse. All Israel will be saved. What do we do with that? So again, he's showing us the three-point plan of God. Hardness on Israel, they reject their Messiah. The Gentiles come in, 
the Jews become jealous and see what's going on, and then all Israel will be saved. It's a controversial topic. I've spent at least three evenings this week just on this verse alone. It's been fun. There's three options that present itself to us as we look at this. One is, so what is, what is Paul talking about when he says all Israel? Some people would say, well, Israel is a chosen people. They're going, they're going to be saved. It's not that because salvation is by faith and faith alone. So there's not two covenants going on here. There's nothing like that happening where, Paul, where God's just going to go, oh, but you guys are Israelites, you come in as well. And the rest of you who believes in Jesus also come. It's not how it works because all of Israel was pointing towards the Messiah. And so there's not that. But what, how, how you can interpret it is either Israel is the church. So some people interpret it like that, and you'll have to go back and have a look at it to see how you feel about that, that Israel is the church, like us now, the true Israel. They take that from Romans 9, verse 6, where Paul says, not all Israel is true Israel. And so it's a quite comforting way of interpreting it. There's another way, which is the elect within Israel, which I won't go into, but that's another way of interpreting it. And then it's to say it's national Israel. When I started this week, I was here. When I ended this week, I was here. (laughs) As I read through Romans chapter 11, Paul uses the word Israel nine times, and every single time he's talking about national Israel. It doesn't make sense that for one sentence in between all the other Israels, he would be referring to a different Israel. And so there is a mystery here. There's something that's going to happen at the end of time when the fullness of Gentiles has come in, when God has done the fullness of what he wants to do in our church, there's going to come a time when there will be a huge revival in Israel and they're going to turn and see the Messiah. It's not all Israelites like every single number in the same way that it's not the fullness of Gentiles. Every single Gentile gets saved. We know that not every single Gentile gets saved. But it's a fullness. There's all Israel. There's going to be this massive time when Israel turns to Christ again. It's far away from us, and it's a huge mystery. And you can read lots of people's PhDs on it. So give it a read. But the bottom line, wherever you land with that, is that God is in control. And God is moving. And so there's two ways that we can respond to this. And I think I've got about three minutes. Am I good? There's, There's two ways that we can respond to this. And Paul shows us both the ways that we can respond. The one is to reach the end and have rest and peace. You've grappled, you've remembered your story, you've looked at scripture, you've received from the Holy Spirit, you've wrestled with God, you've seen Jesus in it, and you can rest and have peace. And the other is to say, I have no clue what's going on here. And Paul says both. (laughs) And you can have both. He's okay with mystery. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has, been given, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory. There's this beautiful passage from Matthew Henry about this. And he says, the apostle Paul knew the mysteries of the kingdom of God as well as any man. Yet he confesses himself at a loss, and despairing to find the bottom, he humbly sits down at the brink and adores the depth. I love that. We reach a point, and we, God isn't God if we don't reach that point. If you can understand everything God's doing, that's not God, that's your mind. But we will reach a point in all of our wrestling with God where we won't get all the answers, and you might be in that space today. Maybe you've been deeply hurt by someone and you can't understand it. You don't understand how this has happened, someone you trusted, or you might be deeply hurting for someone who hasn't, doesn't know Jesus. That's what Paul was doing for his people. You might be in a situation you never saw coming, in your work, in your home, in your marriage. We find ourselves in these situations where we go, but God, you had the plan as I've understood it, this doesn't fit. I don't understand it. How does this work? I want to encourage you to follow Paul's example. Wrestle with God. Go to God. Go to Scripture. All of Scripture. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. Let Him speak to you. Realize that at the end of all of that, you might just have to sit on the edge of God's amazing plan. See, there's, there's, there's the interesting thing about the thing of all things. If you translate that directly, it's all things. From him, through him, and to him are all things. 
your situation right now falls into that. From him and through him and to him are all things. Paul thought that he loved Israel to the point that he was getting really anxious and losing sleep about it. But he realized at the end there's somebody who loves Israel more. And that's God. And it can be the same for you in your situation. You might be thinking, God, you just don't get it. God gets it. And he's in control. And he knows what he's doing. Amen. Thanks so much, Stu. Well done. She's friends, a word like that needs a response. I'm stirred. I'm encouraged. I don't know what you are dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. But friends, let's go to Jesus. Let's not be like Israel who's missed the Messiah. There's an opportunity this morning. If you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never recognized that you need saving, that Jesus is here. He's wanting to save. If you have never given your life to him, there's an opportunity to accept him. I'm gonna ask us to close our eyes. Friends, if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to be bold and stand. If you're wanting to give your life to Jesus, to receive this Messiah. Friends, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the Messiah, that you came for the Jews and the Gentiles. That's why we are here today. And Lord, the stuff that we are going through, the stuff that we are dealing with today, we want to lay it at your feet. Tired of doing things on our own, but Lord, we need you. We need you, Jesus. Thank you that your word is so clear. We pray for each and every one of us here that we'd come and search your word, Lord. We'd come to you every single day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Friends, thank you so, so much for joining us this morning. There are offering baskets at the back and banking details will be on the screen. I missed that one earlier. But please do hang around for some tea and coffee. We'd love to connect with you. And yeah, God bless. Have an incredible Sunday.